A truly omnipresent phenomena across human cultures and throughout human history has been belief in beings which somehow transcend humanity. Gods, angels, ancestral spirits, demons, and aliens are all beings which are thought to exist beyond the realm of normal human experience and the bounds of human rationality. Despite there being an enormous diversity of descriptions attributed to these different beings, it seems to me that there are nevertheless very consistent motifs at play in accounts of such beings, and I suspect that these consistencies might be of immense significance for our understanding of such phenomena. Regardless as to what you believe about ghosts or aliens or angels, I think that it is quite undeniable that the experiences which we might attribute to such beings are themselves very much real. Much like near-death experiences, entity encounters are oftentimes immensely impactful for those who undergo them. These experiences are often traumatic and emotionally jarring, and often leave a person with either a profound sense of spiritual releasement, or a more disquieting sense that their understanding of the world around them has been irreparably shattered by what they have seen. It is this shattering of normality which I believe is itself our most important window into the nature of such phenomena as it seems to be essential to the nature of such experiences in general. These experiences always seem to be the rupturing forth of a world which is beyond our understanding and beyond our control, regardless as to whether the entities encountered are identified as angels, aliens, mothmen, fey folk, butterfly people, or whatever else. The undeniably spiritual character of such experiences would seem to strongly invite a purely psychological explanation. If there is some affinity between such entities and the beings which we encounter in our dreams, or those which we might encounter under the influence of psychedelic substances, then an obvious explanation might be that such entities exist in a strictly psychical, non-physical manner. Nevertheless, such a psychophenomenological explanation very quickly runs aground against the actual details of such experiences. Entities which exist strictly within the confines of the human mind should not be able to be experienced by numerous witnesses simultaneously, let alone play cat and mouse with military fighter pilots. In a letter to the editor of The New Republic, Carl Jung stated the following. Quote, the problem of UFOs is, as you rightly say, a very fascinating one, but it is as puzzling as it is fascinating. Since, in spite of all observations I know of, there is no certainty about their very nature. On the other side, there is an overwhelming material pointing to their legendary or mythological aspect. As a matter of fact, the psychological aspect is so impressive that one almost must regret that the UFOs seem to be real after all." End quote. In Jung's letter, we can see the paradox which seems to be at play in these events. On the one hand, these experiences seem to display an undeniably psychological and spiritual quality. Yet, in defiance of such an explanation, these events seem to rather consistently bear evidence that they are somehow physically, or at least intersubjectively, real. How could a psychical phenomenon be seen by numerous witnesses simultaneously, or be detected with radar? The initial reaction of the modern, rational mind is the sense that such events simply should not be possible. The realm of the psyche is a realm of subjectivity, and objectivity must be grounded in the physical realm of matter. Yet we must also keep in mind that this very division of nature itself, in which mind and matter are separated into distinct ontological categories, is one which is actually a rather recent development which came to predominance following the emergence of scientific rationalism within 17th century Europe. Although such a distinction might seem obvious or even unquestionable to our modern minds, we must also consider that such a mind-matter division itself would have seemed very much alien to the vast majority of human beings throughout the course of human history. 
As such, perhaps it is not these encounter experiences which are paradoxical, but rather the paradox lies in the metaphysical grid which we reflexively attempt to impose upon such phenomena. Before moving forward in this analysis, I want us to briefly look at a few well-known and striking examples which most clearly illustrate this apparent blurring of boundaries between the realms of the psychical and the physical. The first example we will examine is an event which came to be known as the Miracle of the Sun, or the Miracle of Fatima, which occurred on the 13th of October 1917 in the city of Fatima, Portugal. At the center of this narrative was Lucia dos Santos. Lucia's family lived much closer to their church than the local village, and Lucia herself proved to be a precocious and spiritually inclined individual at an extremely early age. At the age of six, Lucia would be given permission to undergo her first communion by a Jesuit priest, as even at such a young age, Lucia had already developed a reputation for her piety and knowledge of scripture. Beginning in the spring of 1916, Lucia and two of her cousins began reporting encounters with beings which they took to be angels. The children reported three such angelic encounters, and in May of the following year, the children reported six separate encounters with the Virgin Mary. This apparition would tell the children that on the 13th of October, a tremendous event would occur in which Mary would reveal herself to the people of Fatima, whose prayers and faith would bring an end to the then-ongoing First World War. Newspapers reported these encounters resulting in a massive stir of interest, rumors, gossip, and speculation surrounding the prophecy relayed by the three children. The craze surrounding this prophecy continued to build leading up to the 13th of October, with thousands of pilgrims coming to witness the fulfillment of the prophecy or to report on the craze which had come to surround it. The three children themselves would even be briefly taken into state custody, as their prophecy was suspected of being a political ploy in defiance of the secular government which had been established in 1910. On the 13th of October, a massive crowd gathered in Fatima, consisting of anywhere between 30,000 to 100,000 individuals. After a period of rain, the sun emerged from behind the clouds over Fatima, and the crowd then experienced what they recounted to be an utterly inexplicable, breathtaking, and for many, life-altering event. Although witness testimonies do vary, the vast majority claim that the sun appeared in an unmistakably supraordinary manner, radiating a rainbow of colors, most notably purple and blue, and moving across the sky in a zigzag-like pattern, which later commentators have often compared to the behavior of certain UAPs or UFOs. Witnesses included poets, travelers, believers, and skeptics, theologians, priests, reporters, and writers. The miracle of Fatima would thereafter become officially recognized by the Catholic Church, and a shrine would be built near the site which has since attracted innumerable pilgrims. What then did those thousands of people actually witness on that day? Perhaps the appearance of the sun might be explicable in terms of some as yet unaccounted for atmospheric phenomena. After all, if the sun itself underwent some superordinary event, then we would expect people from around the globe to have witnessed it, not just the crowd gathered in Fatima. Yet even if we might regard the physical dimension of this event as ultimately being entirely natural, we must nevertheless account for the phenomenological dimension of the event as well. For the vast majority of those who were present during this supposed miracle, what they saw was not simply the sun appearing in a strange way. Rather, what they themselves experienced was an immensely transformative event of singular and enduring significance within the lives of those affected. 
if we wish to regard this phenomenological power as being fundamentally psychological in character, then we nevertheless must concede that power was something which was not simply projected from a single human mind onto the world. This was an experience shared by thousands, and testimonies demonstrate that the overall character of this experience was quite consistent among those who had gathered. Perhaps then we might regard this as being an event of collective rather than personal consciousness. As we've discussed previously regarding the works of Carl Jung and Rupert Sheldrake, we find that beneath the surface of personal human consciousness resides a realm of intersubjective psyche, which consists of archetypal motifs, symbols, and processes, which often come to emerge within myths, dreams, fantasies, works of art, and spiritual experiences. Perhaps the miracle of Fatima was the unfolding of a process which originated within the depths of the collective unconscious itself, and subsequently began to pierce through, as it were, into the realm of ordinary human experience through Lucia dos Santos, whose spiritual precociousness cultivated within her an extraordinary sensitivity to such forces. These unconscious processes would then break through into the realm of waking, conscious experience. Like a wildfire spreading from one tree to another, these forces would come to be ignited within the minds of Lucia's cousins as well. As the collective fervor surrounding their prophecy grew, the unconscious psyche of the crowd which ultimately gathered to witness the prophecy was also primed for the ignition of collective spiritual experience. One might regard such an explanation as a deflationary explaining away, but I certainly don't see it that way. Such an explanation in no way implies that the miracle of Fatima was any less real, but rather it would imply that the event had more to do with processes which unfolded within the realm of psyche more so than with processes which may have physically transpired. Even if we conclude that the appearance of the sun on that day was an unusual but ultimately natural event, it is nevertheless the case that whatever unfolded in the sky that day happened to coincide perfectly with the condition of collective consciousness which obtained within the crowd of people which had gathered there. The synchronization of those events in itself is something which might be indicative of forces which intertwine the physical world and the human psyche in ways which we still yet do not fully understand. Within materialistic thinking, we tend to regard the mental as not being truly real, but consider what exactly we might mean by the word real here. If I believe that I see someone out of the corner of my eye and then turn to face them only to find no one there, I might say that the person wasn't truly real, but rather simply a product of my mind. There was no reality to be found behind the impression within my experience, which I took to be a person. Real people, of course, have physical bodies, and I might then presume that anything truly real must have a physical constitution which underlies the mental impressions which it might evoke. With regards to illusions or hallucinations, the physical reality which we expect to be behind our impressions proves not to be there. But what about cases in which there is something substantial, but nevertheless non-physical, which lies behind our impressions? Can we consider the possibility that there might be something which substantiates our experiences, which is itself not physical, but rather mental in its constitution? In other words, could there be entities which exist independently of any one human mind, but which exist within a shared psychical reality? Here we return to the works of Carl Jung and his conception of a collective unconscious, a realm which consists of primordial symbols, motifs, and processes which pre-exists and preconditions the structures of our individual minds and experiences. 
an archetype, is not simply an inert idea, but rather a living aspect of the human psyche. As we can demonstrate through psychedelic experiences, the archetypes of our unconscious minds are often complex personalities in and of themselves which are very much capable of behaving in ways that seem entirely independent of one's personal agency. Those who delve into the depths of the human psyche through the use of psychedelics frequently report encountering beings within their minds which might be part of the human psyche but which nevertheless appear to have an agency and personality which is distinct from the person who experiences them. We see something similar in cases of dissociative identity disorder, in which a person's psyche comes to fission apart into a multitude of distinct personalities which are characterized by different temperaments, preferences, feelings, and even memories. Perhaps dissociative identity disorder can be seen as a window into the inner nature of the human mind in general. We are all comprised of a multitude of distinct personality aspects which, under normal circumstances, manage to weave themselves together into a cohesive unity which we regard as the human self. Yet under other circumstances, these distinct psychical agents may begin to act separately from one another. We might come to see something which is normally felt to be a part of our own minds as something external. Holes are more than the sum of their parts, but parts are also more than the holes which they comprise. This implies that the person as a whole might not always have access to all of the various psychological processes or entities which can be found within us. If the beings which we encounter within psychedelic experiences are the psychical beings which are simultaneously within us yet distinct from us, then perhaps we could apply this thinking to superordinary experiences such as the miracle of Fatima. Perhaps the beings which Lucius dos Santos encountered were very real, yet fundamentally archetypal beings which reside within the depths of the collective unconscious. If that was indeed the case, then what reason might remain for us to claim that those beings were not in fact angels or Mother Mary? Lucia and her cousin certainly believed that they were visited by holy beings, and many of those who witnessed the events of the 13th of October certainly believed that they saw a very real miracle. If we are to conclude that these events were the eruption of psychical forces which reside within us, then can we simply conclude that the beliefs of those people were, in essence, correct? Here I have been using the term psychical to refer to the ontological nature of such phenomena, but it seems to me that substituting the word spiritual here would be equally appropriate, if not more so. The American ethnobotanist Terence McKenna famously documented and speculated with regards to the various entities which he and many others have encountered during psychedelic experiences facilitated by substances such as dimethyltryptamine, ayahuasca, and psilocybin mushrooms. In his discussions of the psychedelic experience and the beings and realms encountered therein, McKenna often speculated that the most conservative explanation for the apparently sentient beings of the psychedelic world would be that they are essentially ancestral spirits. This possibility has interesting implications, especially if we bring it into contact with the Jungian conception of the collective unconscious mentioned previously. Many Jungians sometimes speak of the collective unconscious as though it were simply an inert reservoir of images or symbols which leak through into the world through the back doors of the human mind. However, if we take the contents of psychedelic experiences more seriously, it would seem that they reveal the collective unconscious to be a significantly more dynamic and substantial world. This world of consciousness would appear to be one in which the past remains very much alive and active, and in which the activity of consciousness acts upon substrates of meaning, language, synchronicity, and resonance rather than upon physical matter. 
What this all might mean for the fate of human consciousness is something which I can't get into in detail here, but is something which I've already explored in some depth in my previous video about the possibility of the survival of human consciousness beyond physiological death. There are certainly also implications for what the evolution of human consciousness might have in store for us, and what the ultimate fate of such evolution might prove to be, but that is a topic which we'll have to wait for future videos after I've been able to lay out a bit more theoretical groundwork. Moving forward, however, let us now turn to the phenomenon of alien UFO or UAP encounters. Despite being a person who was very much open to divergent and radical ideas, even Terence McKenna was himself very skeptical of supposed alien phenomena. His reasoning was rather straightforward. The supposed aliens are simply not alien enough to be actual aliens. These beings are described as looking very much like us, using language which we can oftentimes understand, using technologies which are readily recognizable to us as technologies, and overall being very much human in essence. These supposed aliens perfectly fit the category of transcendental beings but in such a way that seems to be perfectly tailored either for or by the minds of modern human beings. When we imagine something more powerful than ourselves, we immediately think of beings which have more advanced aerospace technologies. Why? Simply because technology is the source of our own power as modern humans, and because aerospace technologies are in many ways the cutting edge of our own technological prowess. This was even more so the case during the post-war era of the 20th century, when alien encounters seemed to first become a well-publicized and widespread phenomenon. When the modern human mind imagines something which transcends it, it imagines something like modern humans, only more modern. Bigger heads, which presumably correspond to bigger brains, as we regard our brains as the seat of our consciousness and the control centers of the rational intellects which we regard as our most valuable assets. Better technologies, as we regard our greatest power to lie in our capacity to extract the world's resources and then shape those resources into machines which serve our purposes. When you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Military pilots are people who are trained to see the world in terms of advanced military technologies, as that is the sort of world which they are inundated within due to their professional careers. As such, when a military pilot sees something unusual in the sky, it is perfectly natural for them to assume that the thing they are seeing is some sort of advanced military technology. Whether they are willing to attribute that perceived technology to extraterrestrials or to secretive terrestrial aerospace programs is mostly secondary and irrelevant. Abductees also often recount that these entities place them upon what appears to have been medical examination tables. To me, this is perhaps the most glaring indication that many of these experiences are fundamentally psychical in nature. Modern medical practices are, in many ways, the modern technological equivalent of the ritualistic and shamanic practices which were engaged in by our ancestors for tens or even hundreds of thousands of years. Within our internal images of the clinical world, we find connotations of intense primal anxieties as well as magical thinking. Unless you are yourself a medical professional, chances are pretty good that you have absolutely no idea how most medications or medical procedures actually work. The clinical realm is, for most people, a realm of both faith as well as ritualized, even sacred, formal practices. The clinical realm is distinguished from the realm of ordinary human life in much the same way that the setting of a shamanic ritual is sanctified and thus delineated from the realm of the ordinary or profane. 
Of course, it is probably the case that you do not consciously think of the clinical world in those terms, but what matters here is that our unconscious minds do see it that way. And this is evident due to the common archetypal motifs which we see exemplified within it. As such, it seems to me rather evident that abduction experiences are very much a form of spiritual experience, in which the human mind is plunged into a world of unconscious archetypes and primal anxieties. It is also extremely common for abduction experiencers to recount such events in ways that are strikingly similar to accounts of miraculous or spiritual experiences such as near-death experiences. Experiencers often state that they feel deeply moved by what happened to them in some way or another. Sometimes these events are said to be immensely traumatic, while others are said to be spiritually liberating, numinous, or ecstatic. Does this then mean that I see such experiences and the beings encountered within them as being simply a fantasy, delusion, or fabrication of the human mind? As our discussion of the miracle of Fatima has no doubt already indicated, I think that these phenomena are significantly more complicated than that, and I think that such a deflationary and dismissive explanation cannot account for the phenomenological fidelity and psychical impact which we find in accounts of such experiences. Nor can such an explanation account for the sometimes shared, intersubjective nature of these experiences. In other words, these experiences are much more than simply dreams, nightmares, hallucinations, or folk tales. To illustrate what I mean by this, let us now look at one of the most notable examples of such encounters and see what we can make of it. On the 16th of September 1994, a group of 62 school children from the aerial school of Rua, Zimbabwe, reported that they had seen a silver, disc-shaped craft descend from the sky and land within a field near their school. The children claimed that humanoid beings dressed in black emerged from the craft and spoke to them telepathically, allegedly warning the children that humanity needed to stop destroying the earth through industrial technologies. As word of this reported encounter spread, reporters would come to interview the children, and their stories would come to be a central pillar within the lore of ufology. Nevertheless, and unsurprisingly, some have called into question the validity of these reports. Interestingly, the supposedly environmentalist message of the alien beings was a feature which was included in only one of the initial three reports of the story. This account was provided by professor of psychiatry John Mack of Harvard University, who was himself an avid environmentalist, perhaps indicating that this aspect of the story originated with Mack himself, whose suggestions took root within the children's thinking about the incident. Two days prior to this incident, on the 14th of September, local radio stations throughout both South Africa and Zimbabwe had been flooded with reports of strange lights, craft, or fireballs appearing within the skies above the region. We might take this foreshadowing to imply that the idea of a UFO sighting had somehow gotten to the children through those local reports and thus motivated them to fabricate the incident. However, we must keep in mind that we are talking about over 60 children of various ages and that those who have been interviewed over the course of subsequent decades have maintained that the story they told was true and that it has come to affect their personal lives ever since. It doesn't take much to prompt a child to make up a story, but the idea that 60 children would spontaneously decide to tell the same story and then maintain that same story for subsequent decades seems to me to be extremely unlikely. Nonetheless, not all of the children interviewed claimed to see what the others saw, as some stated that they did not witness anything unusual at all. Much like the miracle of Fatima, we have numerous witnesses claiming to have seen something absolutely otherworldly, with a few detractors who claim to have seen nothing at all. Might it be then that the aerial school UFO incident and the miracle of Fatima were, ontologically speaking, the same class of phenomena? 
perhaps the reported sightings of strange phenomena in the sky prior to the aerial school incident were indications of something that was actually stirring within the collective unconscious of the people within that region. Perhaps the lights seen in the sky were, as some have speculated, falling meteors or man-made rockets, or perhaps they were something which existed within the psychological dimension of our world rather than the physical. Either way, these events may have acted as a sort of seed which then grew into what was, for the children of Ariel School, essentially a collective spiritual experience. If we look once more to the works of Carl Jung, we can see that superordinary experiences, whether being mystical or psychedelic experiences, or simply dreams, can perform very significant psychological functions within the mind of an experiencer. A very common theme within psychedelic experiences, for example, is an encounter with a being which appears to look like a creepy medieval jester. Understood in a Jungian manner, such a being is a manifestation of the trickster archetype. The trickster is an archetypal personality which we find in mythologies and folk tales such as the Coyote of Native American folklore or Anansi the Spider from West African folklore. The role of the trickster is always to disrupt or subvert the laws of human society or even the laws of nature itself. The trickster is often witty, cunning, and humorous, and uses his abilities to introduce unexpected twists or deception to mythical narratives. The psychological role of the trickster is to reveal the absurdities of the ego's self-aggrandizing delusions. The trickster wants to show you that you are taking yourself too seriously, or that you are much less brilliant and powerful than you might think you are. In breaking down these solidified, narcissistic presumptions, the trickster allows a person to develop humility and thereby proceed along their path of spiritual development or psychological individuation. Perhaps, then, we can see these alien entities, such as those encountered at the aerial school, as performing a psychological role similar to that of the trickster. Perhaps the archetype which they represent is that of a transcendental being, a being which is beyond our understanding and beyond our power, which essentially stands between us and the ultimate mysteries of the cosmos or God. If one deeply believes that the ultimate mystery of being is something which is benevolent, then one might experience such an encounter as one of terrifying but ultimately beautiful and liberating numinosity. The angels of the Hebrew Bible repeatedly tell us, be not afraid. Alternatively, if we suspect that the powers which transcend us might be malevolent or uncaring or unsympathetic to our existence, then such an experience could be profoundly traumatic. In many ways, modern human beings have replaced religious faith with the comforting illusion that we live in a world which we, for the most part, understand and control. If that illusion is abruptly shattered, then such an experience might be utterly horrifying. This sort of explanation certainly has its merits. We can understand these encounter experiences as very real, yet not as being indicative of physical alien creatures from another planet. This would also seem to explain the quasi-religious or even traumatic nature of these experiences. Yet even if we accept such an explanation, we are still left with many questions. Why do these experiences happen at all? Is there some sort of underlying reason or purpose for their occurrence? Why do some people seem to be prone to such experiences while others are not? If the explanation I am offering here is indeed correct, then these questions should ultimately have definitive answers, though it isn't immensely clear how we might go about trying to achieve those answers. Yet potentially this explanation already has one huge problem. What about encounter incidents in which there seem to be clear evidence that something genuinely physical did in fact occur? 
There's certainly quite a few potential examples of such cases. One such incident is known as the Cash Landrum Incident, which is said to have taken place on the evening of December 29, 1980. That night, near Dayton, Texas, Betty Cash was driving home with her friend Vicki Landrum and Vicki's seven-year-old grandson Colby Landrum. The three would later recount that at about 9 p.m. that night, while driving through a very remote and wooded area, they would see a strange light coming from above the trees. The witnesses assumed that they had simply seen a plane, and the light quickly disappeared behind the trees. A bit further down the road, the same light from earlier came back into view, now being significantly brighter and closer to them. The light revealed itself to have been emanating from a huge, diamond-shaped object floating in the sky. The object appeared to be expelling light and intense heat from its base, and Cash stopped the car in fear of being burned if she approached any closer. Cash then exited her vehicle to examine the object while Landrum remained in the vehicle to comfort Colby, who was terrified of what they were witnessing. The heat being radiated by the object was said to have been intense enough that Cash's car became painful to touch, and Cash claimed that she had to use her coat to protect her hand while re-entering the vehicle. The witnesses claimed that the object then ascended over the treetops and a fleet of military helicopters, specifically Boeing CH-47 Chinooks, came into view and began to surround and follow the diamond-like object. As the aircraft and strange object cleared the road, Cash drove forward, seeing the object recede into the distance in her vehicle's mirrors. Following this incident, Cash and Landrum were reported to have developed an identical array of ailments. They were said to have suffered from nausea, vomiting, general weakness, a burning sensation in their eyes, and what appeared to be severe sunburns. Cash reported that over the next few days she would begin to develop blisters on her skin and that her hair would begin falling out in clumps. Although a professional radiologist would confirm many of the symptoms reported by Cash and Landrum, some would also point out that if such symptoms were in fact due to radiation poisoning, then the witnesses would already be dead as the dose of radiation required to produce such a rapid onset of those symptoms would have been far more than lethal. It has been suggested that these symptoms could have been due to some sort of chemical exposure instead. Cash and Landrum would later contact their senators, Lloyd Benson and John Tower, who would advise them to file a legal complaint against the United States federal government. This case would then go to trial, though ultimately the case would be dismissed on the grounds that testimonies from U.S. military officials claimed that no military branch was in possession of diamond-shaped radioactive aircraft. Of course, it is certainly possible that the two witnesses simply fabricated this entire narrative in an effort to procure a monetary settlement from the U.S. military through their court case. The idea that the two women believed that such a ploy would work seems rather ridiculous, but the witnesses were in fact human beings, and last I checked, human beings do have a pretty good track record of being completely ridiculous. As such, it may be rather easy to simply dismiss this case, and I don't think that is necessarily an unreasonable conclusion, but I think the story might look a bit more credible when considered alongside our next incident. The Falcon Lake incident is a reported high strangeness encounter which occurred on May 20th, 1967 at the titular Falcon Lake within Whiteshell Provincial Park in the Canadian province of Manitoba. Our story begins with a man named Steve McCulloch, who worked as an industrial mechanic and who was also an avid outdoorsman and amateur geologist. As such, McCulloch spent a great deal of time at Falcon Lake where he prospected for local quartz and silver deposits. On one of his weekend trips while inspecting a vein of quartz near the lake, McCulloch's attention was diverted by the sounds of a flock of startled geese nearby. 
McCulloch then looked out towards the lake to see what appeared to be two cigarette-shaped objects which hovered above the lake some 45 meters away from his location. One of the objects flew away, but the other came to land on a nearby platform of granite. For over half an hour, McCulloch would observe and investigate the unidentifiable craft before him, and even took the time to create a sketch of the object in a notebook. Eventually, McCulloch gained the courage to actually approach the object. McCulloch said that he saw no markings or insignia of any kind, and also noted that there did not appear to be any seams in the body of the object. The craft appeared to be perfectly smooth and continuous, resembling colored glass more so than metal, though the object seemed to change in color between gray and red, like heated steel, and emitted a kind of orange glow. The object was said to be around 10.5 meters in length and 4.5 meters in height, and produced sounds which McCulloch interpreted to be the hissing and whirring of some sort of engine. McCulloch then noticed that there was an opening in the side of the craft. He donned a pair of welding goggles that he had brought with him as eye protection for his geological work, and looked inside the craft to see what he described as various panels and lights emitting a range of colors. He also claimed to hear what he believed were muffled human voices coming from inside the craft, and he even attempted to communicate with those he thought to be inside, though the voices abruptly ceased after he attempted to speak with them. McCulloch stepped away and touched the craft with his gloves as he did so, though the craft was so hot that it melted the fingertips of his gloves. McCulloch stated that the craft then rotated about, revealing what appeared to be a grid-like exhaust panel. A blast of heat came forth from the panel, hitting McCulloch in the chest as the craft then flew away. McCulloch said that this blast set his clothes on fire, which he then had to tear off of his body. McCulloch would return home and receive medical attention which confirmed that he did indeed have burn marks on his chest, which correlated with the story he told. Much like the Cash Landrum incident, McCulloch is said to have experienced symptoms consistent with radiation poisoning, including nausea, vomiting, weight loss, fatigue, and drastically lowered lymphocyte count. Nevertheless, tests for radiation poisoning came back negative. The story would garner an enormous amount of attention, both from journalists and media, as well as from Canadian and U.S. authorities, who conducted extensive, yet ultimately inconclusive, investigations into the incident. McCulloch himself never believed that he had encountered extraterrestrial beings, and always believed that what he encountered was some sort of secretive, experimental aircraft. He never attempted to benefit financially from this incident in any way, and in fact, he would very quickly come to resent the amount of attention and scrutiny which this story had garnered him. McCulloch and his family suffered repeated harassment due to the incident, and his son Stan would be bullied in school due to his father's story. Exasperated by the incident and the fallout from it, McCulloch would ultimately publish a manuscript titled My Encounter with the UFO, published in 1967, in an effort to definitively settle the account of his story once and for all. McCulloch and his family would then come to retreat from the public eye entirely, living in almost total seclusion in an attempt to break all contact with the outside world. It's rather difficult to find holes in the Falcon Lake story, and contrary to the point I've been trying to make over the course of this video, it doesn't seem possible to explain this as resulting from some sort of psychical or spiritual phenomena. In fact, there are numerous incidents which seem to defy the possibility of such an explanation. Purely psychical entities should not be the sort of thing which should be able to leave behind physical materials, leave burn marks upon human bodies, or cause radiation poisoning. 
it makes some kind of sense that archetypal structures of the collective unconscious might be able to speak to us in a seemingly telepathic manner, but it doesn't seem to make any sense at all that such things should be detected by military radars and tracking cameras. Perhaps we simply have to bite the proverbial bullet and conclude that some such entities are, after all, technologically advanced extraterrestrials from another world, or at the very least some sort of secretive technologies developed by terrestrial militaries. But that explanation would not seem to account for what appears to be, in many cases, the clearly psychological or spiritual nature of such encounters. Why would an encounter with an actual alien creature or secret military aircraft have so much in common with incidents of religious experiences or of sleep paralysis for that matter? It would seem that none of our potential explanations are capable of accounting for all the features which are apparently exhibited by such phenomena. Perhaps the solution to this paradox is simply that we are not dealing with a single phenomenon at all, but rather with a range of phenomena which are unrelated, but which nonetheless have become associated with one another within the popular imagination. Yet there is another possibility which we must consider. If our conceptual categories are unable to track the phenomena which we are trying to account for, then might it be that our conceptual scheme itself is simply inadequate to the reality which we are faced with? It seems rather safe to assume that physical phenomena can cause burns or radiation sickness, while psychological phenomena are confined within our minds, but perhaps we are already making a mistake by assuming that there is a definitive boundary between those two realms to begin with. Ultimately, our minds exist within the same reality which our bodies exist within. And if there were no connection between the two, then it would seem that there would be no point in there being a mental aspect of reality at all. If the physical can influence the mental, then the mental ought to be able to influence the physical as well. That certainly seems to be the case when our minds cause our bodies to do things or when an idea becomes realized within an artistic or technological creation, or even in the so-called placebo effect. But might there also be even stranger ways in which such a blending of the psychical and material realms might occur? Of course, I'm being somewhat vague here on purpose. I'm not sure what the full implications of such thinking might be with regards to things like UFO phenomena. Could it be that processes or entities at work within the collective unconscious might somehow be able to spill over, as it were, into the physical world and thereby leave behind physical evidence and even physical injuries upon those involved? Maybe certain kinds of aliens are primarily mental entities which are able to manifest themselves in a physical way under certain circumstances. Or perhaps certain UFO phenomena really are due to the activity of technologically advanced human-like beings which are visiting us from other planets or even parallel timelines. Regardless as to what sort of explanation we find to be the most plausible or convincing, beings such as aliens and angels seem to be representatives which have crossed a certain kind of metaphysical threshold of the human world. On one side of this divide, we have the world which we seem to understand and even control, within which the things we encounter, no matter how immense or terrifying, are at the very least comprehensible to us. Everything which we are confronted with can be classified and analyzed using a framework of rationality which we feel to be in accord with the nature of reality itself or even exhaustive of reality itself. That framework is one which draws out an invisible and rarely noticed line between what the modern mind can make sense of and what it cannot make sense of. 
Skeptics are so adamant and insistent in their attempts to debunk anything which might seem otherworldly, because ultimately the unspoken claim which they are defending is that no such line exists. That the assumptions grounding modern rationality are adequate to account for anything that might actually be real at all. Their fundamental assumption is that, although we might not yet have all the answers, we have all of the sense-making tools of thought which we might ever need. The hard problem of understanding the world has been solved, and all that is really left to do is to carry out the grunt work of accumulating more and more observational data, and developing mathematical models to account for that data. Those of you who are familiar with my channel will know, of course, that I think we have a wealth of evidence to indicate that such an assumption is simply not the case. Therefore, if we are to continue to advance in our understanding of the world, we must turn our microscopes around and look at our own assumptions about what the world might actually be like. I think that beyond the boundary of normalcy delineated by the paradigm of modern rationality, we will find an immense expanse. A world which is perhaps beyond the reach of our inordinately expensive and titanic scientific instruments, but a world which may nevertheless prove to be much closer to our own lived experiences than we might yet realize. As always, thank you so much for watching, let me know what you guys think in the comments, and be sure to like and subscribe as that helps me out tremendously. Feel free to check out our Discord server if you want to chat about these ideas or just hang out, and consider supporting me on Patreon if you want to see more discussions like these. Once again, thank you.